Hello and welcome to another deep dive. So this time around we are going to be taking a look at Yoon deserialization. Now we've had a bit of a look before at some general stuff with serialization and looking at different formats, areas like of that. But this time around I want to look at specifically some features and functionality built into Unity for serialization and some of the cool things that we can actually do there with that. So let's dive right on in. So we've got a fairly uh, boring scene, but that's because our focus is going to be on the code. So I'm just going to chuck in an obligatory cube that we'll be attaching some code to. So the starting point is I want to show you a really handy trick for if we, because a common thing that we can run into is we've set up a whole bunch of variables, we've got them up and running, we've got data stored in the, that we've adjusted in the inspector for them, and then we find a typo or we find something that means we need to rename that variable. And if we do, we know we're losing all of that data potentially, except not, because we've got a cool little trick that allows us to avoid doing that. Uh, so, name change demo. I think is an appropriate name for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a couple of variables to begin with that we're going to populate with some data. So I'm going to just have a public list of integers and make that scores, except let's make it that I've made a typo. And then we'll also have a public string, uh, and this might be, you know, oh, so many possible names. This could be the title. So a bunch of data that we've got there. And what we'll do is we'll configure this in the inspector. So we'll get some values set up in there. And then we're going to look at how we can avoid losing that data from renaming things. So with this, I'm going to set up a few different scores here. Just give them some simple numbers so we can easily recognize that we've gotten the correct data back. And this is the title. So cool, we've saved everything. And just for good measure to make sure stuff has to be saved, I'm gonna create a new scene and then go back to this one. So we can be certain data is definitely saved. Well, now I want to fix the name of this and I might want to change that title there. That might need to be a slightly different name as well. So what I can do, so I can say using Unity Engine dot serialization. So I have to bring in this other namespace. And then we have this handy little attribute formally serialized as. And then I can say, okay, I put in what its current name is, and then I put in, I fix up the actual name there, and this one formally serialized as title, and this might be level title. So normally what would happen is by doing that, when I went back to the inspector, I would lose all of the data but I won't in this case. And we can see titles there, scores are still there, all the correct values. So this is a really handy way of, if we have need to change or rename things, we can make sure that the data still links up, which is great. Now, eventually what we wanna be able to do at some point is remove this, but we can't remove that until we're confident that every bit of data there has actually been saved and changed. And for example, at the moment, if I went and just, you know, I haven't resaved this level, if I just set up a new scene, it likely hasn't actually saved that data. And if I show this in Explorer and what I can do, not that we often do this, but I can look at the scene here. And if I take a look for S-C-R-E-S, so we can see this data is still being serialized as the old version. It hasn't resaved this level. So that's something to be aware of that 
unless we actually, you know, to get it to re-serialize this, because it doesn't think there's any changes, I would have to go and do something like, if I go and change this, so this is the level title. So just need to change anything on it and save that. Then we come back and take a look at the file. It's gone through and done the actual updating. So now I would be able to remove these attributes. Before then, if I'd removed them, it wouldn't have matched the data correctly. So once it's resaved, we can go and check the data. Now the challenge there can be, okay, Unity, we, you know, we wouldn't want to have to go in and edit every single particular thing. You, you can imagine that this could be something that could happen with we're renaming something and we might have 50 scriptable objects that we have made this change to. We don't want to have to go and open every single scriptable object, make a modification to it, and then resave it. That's a, a huge overhead. And so that, that's something we want to avoid. And there are ways that we can get around that. So that's where we can create a little helper editor script because it's possible to tell Unity to, okay, this particular asset, mark this asset as dirty and then tell it to save all the assets. That's what I've done there before in those cases is I set up a little helper script and then told it to mark things as dirty and force save things. It's a way of being able to work around that. But the key thing is, is we don't need to get too hung up on the names we use then as a result, because we can easily go in and fix these. And we just use that formally serialized as. It's a really, really handy way of being able to uh, work with changes like of that. So that's one little trick with Unity serialization that allows us to handle renaming of things. Really cool, really handy. Now let's look at another trick. And this is where, if you've watched the previous serialization one, you remember that I said that one of the things with Unity's default built-in serialization is it doesn't support serializing dictionaries. It supports serializing things like a list, but not a dictionary, not sort of complex uh, data structures like that. So there's ways that we can work around that. And there's also ways that we can potentially uh, take a little bit more control over how stuff gets serialized so that we can speed up the performance there or so that we can do some neat little tricks. So I'm going to set up a script here uh, that I'm going to call serialization. Uh, actually hook serialization. Actually, no, I'm going to call it complex data. Because this is something we'd set up on each individual class that needs this. So what we're going to do is there is an interface that we can implement. I serialization callback receiver. Now, what this does is this means that our class here will get particular functions called in it at different stages of serialization. And we can go and take a look at this interface and we can see here are these two particular ones that we need to set up on after serialize, well, on after deserialize and on before serialize. Now, understanding what these do and where they actually happen can be a little bit confusing. The naming is definitely uh, a process there that is not the most intuitive. So it's easy to get confused with them and that's okay. So we're going to set up, I'm gonna put these right at the top here. So this, and I'll put the comment above this. This runs on load after Unity has loaded the data that it can for our class. So any data that it understands, it will load it and then calls on after deserialize. Its counterpart on before serialize, so on before 
serialize. This runs on save before Unity writes the data it can for our class. So really important to understand the stages where these run at uh, because they run at very, very different points. And we need to make sure that it's got those names matching exactly. And what we'll be able to see is this allows us to hook in and do some pretty cool tricks. So go back to Unity. Uh, and of course, missing the fact that the thing in interface needs to be public. So, in terms of then how we go about using these, so let's set up a scenario where a few different things we could do. So, one of the, the good examples is something like a dictionary. So, we might want to present a dictionary to the rest of the code, but we can't serialize a dictionary. So, that's okay. So we set up our dictionary and let's assume this is a dictionary that the keys are strings and we'll say the values are an integer. And this might be something like our you know, configuration parameters, something like of that. Uh, so maybe we'll call these our, our balance or our, our game stats. Game stats. So this is what we want other things to be able to access, but we can't serialize that. So what we can serialize though, is if we have, and that might be, that might, game stats might be something that everything in our code directly works with. And then what we have is we have a list of strings. So this might be game stats keys, a list of integers, game, stats, values. Now we need these to be serialized. Serialize field, serialize field. Now we could do custom inspectors for controlling how this appears to manage that as well. For now, we'll just have these be a serialized field for this. So, okay. After on deserialize has run, so when, when we've run this, these two lists will have been populated. They will have valid data in it. So it's at this point that we can construct our dictionary. So we could be saying, okay, well, one of the things we'd probably want to do is we could do some sanity checks here in terms of, okay, if game stats keys count is not equal to game stats values dot count. Well, in this case, that's a pretty serious problem. That's actually quite a serious problem. So I'm actually going to throw uh, missing, I think missing field exception, or actually there's an array. It's probably an array exception or an argument out of range, maybe an index exception, index out of range, that's probably not a bad one. So in this case, mismatched keys and values, mismatched size. Just so that we are handling that, is this is very, very bad if this happens. We do not want it to be the case uh, that we don't have the correct number of keys and values. We need to ensure that it's the exact same amount. So then, okay, we know our keys and values, we've got a perfect match there in terms of size. So we can check and see, I don't actually fully recall uh, with our dictionaries if uh, we can initialize them by giving them uh, just two arrays. We'll check and see. Be really handy. Doesn't look like we can, uh, but that's okay. We can initialize that. And then what we can do is index is equal to zero. Index is less than 
uh, game stats keys dot count index and then we just add these in so game stats game stats keys at index is equal to game stats values at that index so we just build up our dictionary construct the dictionary so that's good got our dictionary set up now we want to then have the setup here for well we're we're doing this before serialize so we might have changed this dictionary so we want to synchronize things back from that dictionary to those lists so we can do that what we would do is we would say okay well game stats we can access the keys so we could be saying okay our game stats keys is equal to and we'll do a new list and we'll pass in the keys like that game stats values is equal to a new list again passing in the values so game stats dot values the other thing we can kind of do here is because we don't need those arrays at this point so game stats keys we could set to null game stats values we could also set to null so we also then at this point if we needed to we could nuke that dictionary which is not necessarily a terrible idea and then game stats is equal to null so just but i would probably yeah i would lean towards not doing that unless we absolutely need to and same with nulling out those there's some advantages we could get with the inspector for avoiding doing that uh, so I want to keep it just fairly simple, but this will save out that dictionary by putting stuff into those particular keys and we can test this. So we're going to attach this onto our cube and then we're going to set up a bit of logic for actually working with this. Uh, so we'll attach this into here. So that's good. We've got our keys and values. Uh, so we can populate in some initial values there potentially but what we are actually going to do and we can see getting an exception here and that's because this is null so what we would say is f game stats is not equal to null then we can do this That. So important some little things we need to watch for with it. So now it's going to be a lot happier and we can safely save and load. Things like that are going to work completely fine. And what we want to do is we want to add some entries in here. And there's a lot of different ways we could be working with this. Um, so one of the things that we could do is in our start here well in start let's loop through uh, key value pair in game stats and we're just going to debug log key actually key and we'll grab the key it's equal to the value so that will log out the particular ones. Now at the moment, we're not going to see any in there. That's what we expect. We don't, we, we wouldn't expect to see any data in there at the moment. So if we run that, we don't get anything as expected. Now we want to start populating some things into here. And so what we can do is we've already got this set up where it will ensure uh, it'll, it'll safely handle if there's nothing there. Let's set up a little bit of a editor script to work with this. So we're going to create a folder editor. And we're going to create another script in here. Complex data editor. 
So what this will be is we can bring in using Unity Editor. This will be based off of Editor. So we need to let it know what it's an editor for. So we would say custom editor type of complex data. And then our usual editor functions, we need the public override void on inspector GUI. And what we're going to do is just draw uh, the default inspector for now. Uh, but we're going to also chuck in a button add data. So with add data, what we will do is we'll grab the target here. So complex data target is equal to uh, serialized object dot target object as complex data. And then we'll be able to say, okay, target, well, we know we've got our game stats struct here, so target game stats, and might have health equal to 100. And because we're making changes here, we do need to let Unity know that we are making changes. So record object, and we would say target, just so it knows that we are making changes here. So we'll go back to Unity and we just need to make sure set health. So that looks good. So that'll mean we'll have a inspector button that we can click on that will adjust stuff. So let's see what happens when we do add data. So it's run and you'll notice we've got data in there now. Those changed. If we chuck in a couple of other ones here, because we've got health, uh, let's also chuck in uh, jump height, might be two, and we'll press the button again. And if we watch, we'll see we now have two entries. We go to save this, and then if we run it, it's going to run and we've got our health and jump height. And if we take a look at that seam, we'll be able to see, if we search for health, we can see our keys and we can see values because the values, it, the values looks a little bit weird uh, because of the fact that it's a list of integers. So it's doing a few extra uh, tricky things in terms of how it serializes those to make it a little bit more efficient in terms of what it's storing there for the data. But the key thing is, is we've got control now over this serialization. We're taking our data and we're able to present it to the rest of the code in a really useful manner by having it there as a dictionary, but for our own internal working with it, we can still be using the Unity serialization by having that there as lists. We can go more complicated than this as well. And kind of conveniently, this has already illustrated that. So we could actually pack data more tightly. This is something that I've done before with things where we, you know, an integer, yes, an integer is, you know, good for storing numbers, but an integer is also a certain number of bytes. So you can pack data more closely into that. And this is something that gets used in particular on large games as a way of really efficiently storing data so that our file sizes are as small as we can make them. So we could do that. We could pack data into particular things. So one of the things that I could do is I could have something where what we have serialized, and again, a lot of these things we would have custom inspectors for. So I might have a serialized integer, and this might be packed data. So that's serialized. 
but that might correspond to a bunch of things. So that might correspond to, and I'm going to explicitly mark this as not serialized. So system.nonserialized. We might have stuff there where, okay, we might have, uh, you know, that corresponds in part to health non-serialized and that might also correspond to jump height things like that so this might be the versions that we present to the user for actually seeing but internally well if our health is never going over a hundred we don't need to use an integer for it we can compress this into smaller data so what I could do here is Okay, well, this is after we've loaded it. So I might be able to then say, well, health, that's equal to packed data and zero by FF. So I could use the lower eight bits to store the health. I could then say the jump height is equal to packed data and this might be stored in the next eight bytes. So I do a shift by eight bits again, ended with zero by FF. So it gives me, I can remove those brackets. So unpack the bit field. That's what we're using these as is something called a bit field. We're packing the data tightly. So we're unpacking the bit field. And then here, pack the bit field. So how we would do the packing is, okay, well, pack data is equal to health anded with zero by FF. So we ensure that it's staying constrained within those eight bits. Ord with, we take our jump height again, making sure it's anded so it's constrained to its particular section. And then we shift that. Uh, and I think I got my shift order around the wrong way. I believe that should be shift right, and this should be shift left. Or I've gotten those around the wrong way again, and I'll need to check. Uh, but what I will do is debug log health is health debug log jump height is jump height and I will then also in my complex data editor add in some stuff here where we can go target health is equal to 127 and target dot jump height is equal to 53 I might make that 120. So we've got stuff where we're pushing data into it, which is important. And then we'll see how that works for extracting it out. There is a potential that I've gotten my uh, left shift, right shift swapped around the wrong way. Uh, we will find out. So at the moment, the pack data is zero. Go add data. And that's looking actually pretty much right. So we'll run it. And then and we'll be able to see health is 120, jump height is 53. So we've got a setup now where we're packing that data in. So we could start to then our inspector, we don't might not draw the default inspector. We could actually get our individual properties and then we could modify those particular ones. So let's go and do that stage of it. So we've already got little bits there for our serialized object, for our adding data. So I won't do all of the particular elements, uh, but I will do a couple of the, the key ones that we are working with. So public void on enable. And we'll have serialized property. So I want to have the backing field for this is what the serialized property is. So packed data. So packed data prop. Uh, I'll also set up serialized properties 
for these two ones for the keys and the values. So game stats keys prop and serialized property for game stats values prop. Now for those, I will just keep it very simple. The reason there being that I don't want to dive too deep into uh, inspector stuff with this. I want to keep it focused on working on the particular data, but it is something that we could uh, go and set up specific editors there for this. Uh, so, and with those, we wouldn't actually change that. And we won't actually change a lot of these particular ones. These ones I'm keeping there because I need those there. Uh, so what we would do is we would be able to say, uh, we've got a serialized object find property, and in this case, I'll retrieve that. So we've got that one, and then we'll do the same for retrieving the values. And actually, we won't need the pack data prop, because then what we do here is we'll be able to do our editor, here we layout, property field, and we'll just put the keys and the values so they can work as they normally would. And then what we'll do is we can do a specific field for our health and for our jump height. So to set up the field for our jump height, we can go editor, GUI layout, and in terms of the field, well, we want an integer field. So the value, well, if we take our target here and we're going to bring the retrieval of this up, we'll bring it right to the top. So we would say target dot health. And we have a lot of different options here that we can be providing. So there's a huge range of different variants for this int field. Uh, and I think the one that we'll go for is this one. So we'd say health. And we would say target.health. The way this works is you do target.health is equal to that. And then we would also have one for target jump height. Edit a GUI layout, int field, jump height, target dot jump height. And then we need to make sure it's populating the things. So add data can stay as it currently is. Uh, but what we would do is we would say serialized object apply modified properties. So that looks pretty good. Let's test how this works. So it should mean that we can in the inspector change things like our health. And what it's referring to is just the things in that backing field. So we can see we've got our values there. Uh, so let's change this to so the health is 73 and the jump height is 62. And let's run it and see what we get in terms of the output. So we can see it's updating. So we've got fields that we're showing in the inspector that have no relation to what the fields are in terms of the backing data for storing them. So this can be a really handy way of providing a particular interface in the inspector, but then doing something very different behind the scenes in terms of how you structure and store the data. So really useful there. I use it at times for when I've got really complex data that I want to store that data in a very tightly packed manner. So I want to make advantage of things like, okay, well, this value is never going to go over a certain amount, so I can pack multiple things into the same integer, for example. So really useful technique there. So just recapping a couple of the key things that we looked at. So we saw if we're changing the name of something, we can handle changing the name of a variable and avoiding losing data 
by using formally serialized as. It gives us a way of being able to make sure we've still got the data present there in our project. We also saw that we can say that we are implementing iSerialization callback receiver, which allows us to get two functions. And on after deserialize, which Unity calls after it's loaded all of the bits of our class that it understands. And then we also have on before serialize, which Unity runs before it takes those things it understands and stores them out to disk. So we can use that for managing things like serializing a dictionary or for having fields like health, jump height, things like of that, that we pack tightly into another variable. So it gives us a way of having control over how the underlying data is stored and how the data is presented in the inspector and to the rest of the code. And it allows us to do very different things there with each of those so that we can try and get kind of the best of both worlds. We can get really efficient storage and we can get nice usable interfaces for the data that we might not otherwise be able to achieve. So it's really valuable, really helpful there with that. So I hope you found the video helpful, folks. If you have found it helpful, please do chuck in a like and subscribe. It really does help out. And if you're looking for the code for the project, the full code for the project is available up on GitHub. As with all of the projects, you're able to use that code for any of your own ones, whether those are commercial or non-commercial. If you've got questions, chuck in a comment below. And if you are looking for other ways to support the channel, I do have a Patreon and the link to that's in the description below as well. Bye.